Tin Miguet, Shibushu, Nibi Shikoyen, Dishnikaz, Nishnabe Koyen Dao, Minwame Shika Koyen Dao, Jijak and Dodem, Poniak and Dunjaba, Bawating and Dao. And what I said there was my name in the language, and I said hello to everyone. Um, my name in the Anishinaabe language is Water Woman, so Nibi Shikwe, which actually means like water with something in it. So the things that I really love are like anything with tea and uh, a lot of medicines that happen in the water. So really happy to be here tonight. I'm calling from Sault Ste. Marie, Michigan which is a really special place and I feel really grateful to be living and working and, and thriving on our own Anishinaabe territorial homelands here in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. Uh, it's a really special place because if, if you would open up a map and look at where it is, we're as far north as you can go in the United States here on the Michigan side until you reach the St. Mary's River, and then there's the International Bridge to Sioux, St. Marie, Canada. So we're right in this really cool spot where we're between two of the Great Lakes, and uh, we have a third Great Lake that's really close by as well. So the land, the water, they're all really important and very central and foundational to the Anishinaabe people. My tribe that I'm enrolled in is the Boys Fort Band of Chippewa Indians in Net Lake, Minnesota which is pretty far north as well. It's about an hour south of International Falls. So uh, I've, been, I, I've been in Michigan my whole life, born and raised here. So really just thankful to be coming to you from this land. Uh, it's really a great place to be because historically Sault Ste. Marie and other places along the waterways in the Great Lakes region were places where a lot of tribal nations would come together to gather, to share knowledge, to make really important decisions about our treaties, about uh, how to move forward in our, you know, in our new way of life. And through those waterways, we can reach so many other tribal nations. So I see this as being like one of the perfect places to be to do what I get to do in this realm, which is to uh, teach and share and learn and sit in community with many of you who are on this call tonight. So I just wanted to give that acknowledgement and say thanks to everyone for being here and especially to some of my own teachers and students and as well as my elder who uh, I wanted to acknowledge before uh, we were chatting, I was like, why do I always get myself in these big groups of people? And she said, it's because you're passionate and it's meant to be. So I'm um, really thankful. I wanted to talk about cradle boards tonight, but I wanted to start by sharing the story of how I came to be doing this work and to give some acknowledgement to how cradle boards have really made a resurgence here in Michigan. So when I talk about our community, I really mean the whole state of Michigan because the way that I do things and the way that our people are, we do a lot of traveling. I've traveled extensively to most of the tribal communities here in the state. Uh, if for those of you who aren't aware here in Michigan, we do have 12 federally recognized tribes in our state. And then we have a handful of communities that aren't federally recognized, but who are seeking that recognition. Uh, and we have several large urban Indian centers as well. So we have quite a lot of native people in the state. It's a really wonderful place to be in. And within the past, like, I would say three to four years, there have been a lot of efforts by a lot of people, not just myself, but by a handful of folks who really been devoted to uh, reclaiming and remembering and restoring the traditional practice of using cradle boards. And it, for me, the journey into learning about cradle boards and to uh, come into a position where I get to share this knowledge with others it wasn't because like, I was raised myself in a cradle board. I wasn't raised in a cradle board. Um, I actually grew up in a pretty small rural town in northern Michigan where I was literally like the only native person and I didn't really even know that there were other Anishinaabe out there because I lived such a sheltered life within my little small town. 
until I went off to college and then I went to Michigan Technological University in Houghton, Michigan, which is pretty close to two tribal communities on the western end of the Upper Peninsula. And so I was like, my mind was blown that there were all these Anishinaabe around me this whole time and I didn't really know that. Uh, my mom raised me with, you know, as much of the culture as she could, but she didn't have a lot of access to that either. So a lot of what I learned really started about 13 years ago when I went to undergraduate, when I also had my first child, who wouldn't have been a cradleboard baby. She hated to be swaddled. She's always been doing her own thing since she was born. She'd never, ever liked to be tucked into blankets or... Uh, even to be swaddled, she wouldn't have enjoyed the cradle board most likely, but um, that really kicked off my interest and my curiosity. Like, what what is this thing? I was hearing about it a little bit here and there from some of my teachers in college. And then, you know, a lot of these pieces, they feel really cellular. And when you talk about them, you kind of have a memory or you might've heard stories from your family. And so I really like to bring these conversations forward to share it out in the community because people start to piece together uh, some, of the, some of the puzzle pieces from their own history as well. So fast forward to uh, when I went to graduate school, I went to a master of public health program at Michigan State University and just living in an area, there are a lot of other Anishinaabe uh, really diving into like inquiries around uh, maternal and child health, infant mortality, prevention and reduction, and really interrogating why uh, we see some of the disparities that we do see in our community in terms of infant mortality, infant morbidity, and just wondering what wisdom existed in our communities in terms of infant mortality prevention. But not only that, but how did our babies thrive? Like, how did we get to be so epic and so resilient. And I really believe that about our people. I have the best, I have only great things to say about our ancestors. And so I started to really dive into like researching cradle boards. This was, you know, back before I uh, was doing a lot of traveling to other communities, but I had connected with some direct teachers who were sharing bits and pieces of the cradle board story to the Anishinaabe. And uh, I, I really enjoyed that inquiry and, and I wanted to go a little deeper. And at the same time, I was uh, working as a birth worker. I've been doing birth work for a long time, for about 13 years now. Uh, so I've been working with families for a long time, just like hearing little bits of what they have to say about how they carried those stories in their families as well. But what I saw is that when I went into like the professional world after graduate school, I didn't see that there were a lot of families using the cradle board. But what I saw was that people were very, very interested in it. And along with the reclamation of a lot of our traditional practices like breastfeeding and birthing and postpartum care, uh, it all, all, and all of it is related to like our food sovereignty and a lot of the other efforts that are going on in our community. I saw this deep interest in this deep desire for people to want to connect to their teachings around the cradle board. So when we were planning to conceive our second child, uh, many, many years later after the uh, first one was born 10 years later, I uh, connected with one of my direct teachers and mentors, a very dear friend, Beth Earl, who's uh, Shawnee and Potawatomi. And I asked, you know, she was aware of anyone in our communities who were making cradle boards that we could purchase one from or that we could go there and like be a part of making the cradle boards so that we would have one ready for when our son came along. And she connected me to a Potawatomi elder uh, by the name of Dr. Casey Church, who makes cradle boards. And then I was like, um, why don't we all put our heads together to bring him here to Michigan at the time he lived in Albuquerque, New Mexico. And um, this sort of started like a whole firestorm of cradle board gatherings in our state. So this is about three to four years ago. So it was really like a, a team of people that brought Dr. Church here. He came uh, to 
show us how to construct the cradle boards. He came with a, a lot of generosity and a lot of just um, a lot of humility. And, and he was so gracious in sharing not only how to make the cradle board, and he had his own design for a cradle board that's based on the Potawatomi or Anishinaabe style cradle boards. Uh, but his wife is also Diné and he has lived a lot of his life uh, in, in Diné culture and his children are Diné and also Anishinaabe. So there were like some of those teachings woven into the way that he presented as well. And then I have another relative in my Mashika Kapuli, brother Wayne, we call him, who he's kind of the opposite. He is Diné, but he has spent a lot of time being raised by Anishinaabe people. So I just say that to bring forth like all of the different lineages and all the different teachers and all the different people who have really been a part of my story. And so when I bring that to you, that's, that's what I just want to be transparent about. So we brought Dr. Church here and he first came with, um, I think 20 or 25 cradle boards. And we had like this big three day gathering where we, you know, we really learned uh, the stories of the cradle boards, how to construct them. And then we spent the time actually putting them all together and um, you know, doing a lot of sharing. And there were people from, I think three or four different tribal communities in our state who came to that original gathering. And we actually did it as a train the trainer model. So everyone who went there could leave like feeling really confident and comfortable to bring the teachings back to their community, as well as bringing a handful of cradle boards that they could disseminate in whatever way they found to be appropriate. People were so very interested in that and uh, it just bloomed uh, after that. And so we had uh, several more gatherings in quite a few more communities here in Michigan, as well as uh, my teacher took some boards out to Minnesota as well. So all together since that very first gathering uh, about three and a half years ago, we have seen over 125 cradle boards go back out into our community and many, many of them have been put to use by families. So we are seeing families actually putting their babies in cradle boards. And, and so it's really special and I just wanna give that acknowledgement because it's really a historic part of our community's story. You know, I think that someday we can look back on this time and be like, that's the time when cradle boards came back. And it was so amazing to be a part of that because we would go out to the community, we would share teachings, not only on the cradle board, but about newborn care and about postpartum health, about breastfeeding, about how everything in from birth to postpartum is so related and interconnected. And now I hear these little stories from people and they would come up to me and say like, we had cradle boards, you know, two generations ago. And ever since then, the crate, we've like, we've kept the cradle boards in the basement because people didn't really know how to use them or they weren't sure if you could hand them down from one generation to the next. And a lot of people are like wondering about the safety of the cradle boards. And, you know, we're getting wrapped up into these broader discussions around uh, infant health and infant safe sleep and all of these complicated discussions. So I just love that complexity and I love the nuance, but I love the fact that people had cradle boards in their basement and that due to this resurgence that we were able to be a part of, people were like, we're gonna pull these out and start looking at them. And uh, I've seen these families actually reviving the tradition of putting their babies in cradle boards. So we have two pretty uh, distinct types of cradle boards in the Anishinaabe community. We have one that is like the traditional board that you know, where it's like a hard, you know, piece of wood. That's a, like a long, straight piece of wood. And um, I'm going to grab mine. It's just right behind me. Give me just a second. And this type is... Uh, I don't have the little bow on it because my son let me know he was done 
it was his last time in the cradle board when he woke up from his last nap in the cradle board he literally just grabbed the bow and took it off <laughs> so i like knew that was a sign that he was finished with it but um this is like the traditional type of board that most of you are probably familiar with it would have a bow up here on the top or my one of my teachers calls it the roll bar and then it has a foot uh like a little pedal down here at the bottom and so these are traditionally made out of cedar. That's the customary type of wood. This is a different type of pine. It's quite a bit heavier. Cedar is very, very light uh, compared to this one. And uh, this is Dr. Church's like unique design. So he does a sort of wavy design here at the top. And then again, down at the bottom. We have another type of cradle board that is made out of birch bark. And it is more like, um, it kind of has a curve. It's almost like a little swing that you would lay them in. And it's for real small newborns. So this one would last all the way from birth up to a year or even more, depending on how big the baby was. But the birch bark ones were like a lot smaller. And so they were really for swaddling and keeping close to very small newborn babies. And so there's a lot of symbolism in that board and that's what I wanted to share with you tonight. Uh, there's a lot of symbolism. It's really important in Anishinaabe culture. So like a lot of our crafts and our beadwork and our regalia and uh, a lot of the artifacts that are common in our culture are pretty heavily influenced by a lot of uh, symbolism. So everything has a purpose. Everything is meaningful in our board. And we say that uh, the wood itself is like uh, a medicine for the baby. So it's not just a piece of wood. You know, the way that we pick out which piece of wood we're going to use for our own family, we do so with a lot of intention. So we we had our workshop, we had, you know, the 24 boards, they were already shaped and sanded. But what we did was go up. And so every person literally look at each piece of wood and look at all of the unique markings it's easier to see on the back and look for like there were certain patterns that you were really drawn to um, certain things in the wood that were like really speaking to you or certain shapes like one person saw that there was a heart and so heart medicine is really important in their family uh, one person noticed that there there was some marking in the wood it kind of looked like a pregnant mom with like a big belly uh, so there are opportunities to infuse medicine into this every step of the way, starting with how the wood is chosen and starting with which piece you actually use to construct your board with. So the symbolism is really important there. We, there, there are two teachings around uh, the wood and like how smooth you want it to be. Like I said, they came already cut and sanded and we just put everything together with the holes and stuff but um if you were to go out and like actually fall a tree or to find one out a cedar tree out in the woods and do it in the very old traditional way you might notice that there are like some knots in the wood or some sort of natural divots and uh, some we had someone who asked well would you sand those down or would you leave it the way it is, do you want the board to be as smooth as possible or is it okay if it has some of that sort of natural grain? And like everything in our culture, there's always a completely opposite teaching. So um, you could go like eight miles down the road where I live and ask a question and get the complete opposite answer. So it just shows there's a lot of diversity even within our own Anishinaabe people and the stories that we carry. So I'll share both and leave it up to you what you think is true. Uh, I heard one way is that we smooth down the board as much as possible because that way when we put the baby in there, it, it represents for them like a smooth and easy life with not a lot of bumps in the road, like just a very easy and peaceful and easeful journey for them. And then on the other hand, and this is the teaching that comes from my community specifically, is that we would leave those divots and all of those like bumps in the wood. We wouldn't sand it over because we don't want to sand down the medicine of that tree. 
um, you know, all of those bumps are just like little spots where the baby's laying on. It's just an extra opportunity for them to like get the medicine that the tree has to offer. So I resonate with both of those. It just so happens these boards were already sanded down. So they were pretty smooth. But I absolutely love that because we're always looking to be very intentional with our children, with the colors around them, with the people that are around them, with the way that we carry them. It really reflects how much care and thought goes into bringing them forth into the world and the responsibility that we have when we make that agreement. And so I wanna share uh, a little bit about the origin story. So the Anishinaabe origin story, not of our nation, but of us as individuals, because that symbolism is reflected in our cradle boards. And it's really important to understanding why our cradle boards are so important and why I am so excited to see people um, bringing these back into their family. So it's said in our uh, our traditional stories that each of us existed already on what we call the other side. So some people call it the spirit realm, some people might call it um, the creator's world or the ancestor realm. In our language, it's called Anjikin, which means the land of everlasting happiness. And on that other side, life is just perfect. Um, I, I, we exist as one spiritual being on that other side that can actually live many different lives in many different forms here on this realm. And when we are up there, before we make the choice to become a baby and to uh, descend down here into uh, Anishinaabe Aki or to Mother Earth, we are actually given the opportunity to, to have like a preview of everything that's to come in our lifetime. So we actually have like a council of seven grandmothers and seven grandfathers that sit in this circle. And we can go around and ask each one of those uh, elders what we can expect on earth. Like what is life like down there? And we'll get to hear, you know, all of the pros and cons. Anishinaabe always say that life here is very beautiful, but it's not guaranteed to be easy. That's never a guarantee in, in the way that we uh, conduct ourselves. But we also get to hear not only what life is like down here and the pros and cons and the nuances and complexity of being on earth, but we get to literally see every single thing that's going to happen to us. So we say that when we have that feeling of deja vu, like when you sit down to like a meal and you're like, I swear I have tasted this before. Like when you meet somebody and you just feel like you really know them, but you can't place your finger on where, that's why. So that deja vu feeling is because you're just seeing again, everything that you knew was going to happen in your life. And this is really important because sometimes people will say like, you know, our babies, um, they didn't ask to come here, <laughs> but our belief is that actually we did because when we, you know, when we were up there and we asked all those old people to tell us what life would be like down here, we got to have a preview of everything that could come to us. Despite all of the hardships and despite all the difficulties, we know that our purpose is so important and that our job to, the job that we have to do, like our sacred karmic job, um, was so important that we still agreed to come, even though we saw ahead that we're going to face, you know, we're going to face death, we're going to face difficulty, we're going to face um, a lot of beauty. There's a lot of great things about being in this realm as well. So we did make that agreement. And that is the time when we also choose the parents that we want to bring us forth for that purpose. So this just gives us uh, even more incentive or uh, motivation or inspiration to really, really hold our babies with a lot of care and a lot of tenderness and a lot of respect because they literally looked ahead at everything that was possible for them and still chose us out of everybody because we are helping them to do some job. And so it's our responsibility to really hold them with a lot of care 
And we don't take that responsibility lightly. And so after making the choice to come down to earth via the parents of our choosing, we, we have our birthing ceremony. And ceremony very simply is, the way that my abuela explains it is, it's the movement of energy. And so it can be very epic and it can also be very simple. Uh, one of the most epic transformations or movements of energy that we can experience in this realm is that of birth, our own birth, giving birth and also in our own passing back to that other side. So like there's no greater energy that we can move than that of life itself. So the birthing ceremony for that baby or that spirit on the other side who's waiting to come down via the parents of their choosing is uh, there is this, what we call in the language, I can never say it right, but it's basically, it's called the path of souls. And if you like in the English language, you call it the Milky Way. So if you look out in the sky and you see that doot, 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 uh, with all the light and colors, that's the Milky Way. And that's what we call our path of souls. It has like in um, the symbolism of that is like, it's in this sort of funnel shape or like the shape of um, a pathway. And so just look at the cradle board and tell me what you see. You see that exact shape. So you see the path of souls um, that that baby takes in their birthing ceremony to come from Anjikin down to Anishinaabe Aki. And so it shows you that this is one of the ways that that baby is reminded of that journey, but is also like, held in a way that's very safe and very comforting for them because that journey is a lot of work. Uh, that ceremony, that birthing ceremony, it's a lot of work for the birthing person and also for the baby uh, because just the, the, the miracle or the, the ceremony of bringing life forward, moving that energy from literally one realm to this realm uh, is uh, a, a lot of effort and output for the birthing person because you know birth is hard work but also for the baby because as you know uh, everyone here in this audience probably knows that the babies are very much an active participant in the birth they're doing a lot of their own little movements to come out down through the pelvis down through the birth canal and there's a lot of like there's still a lot of things we don't even know like how the baby decides its time and how it communicates that to our body it's all part of the beautiful mystery of that birthing ceremony. But for that birthing person, when that transformation happens, it happens very quickly to the outside eye, to, uh, to discerning birth workers or to people who like witness birth. It, it's easy to know because you'll look at that person and you'll see that there's just a small point in time where they seem to like check out or literally go into like another world. And sometimes they'll even say, uh, you know, I felt like I was in another world or, um, you know, they'll, 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 they'll say things that they're not meant for you to hear because they're speaking to people on that other side. So what has happened is that they're actually in the moment uh, when the baby is just there in, in what we could call the crowning phase or in a surgical birth when the baby is just about to be lifted out, um, that's when they're actually going down that path of souls to the other side to bring their baby or to meet the baby and then to come back. And again, it's in that shape. And that shape is really significant. That symbolism appears again and again in this story because not only present in that uh, space. So the space between worlds that we go on in our birth and then back uh, and when we pass back to that other side, it is like the shape of our a womb. So the womb has that sort of shape too, where it's like larger at the top and then it comes down to um, eventually to become the cervix and then the birth canal. So this symbolism becomes really important. And Postpartum care really is very important because the ceremony of birth isn't done just when the baby is born. There's a lot of um, openness, a lot of 
transformation, a lot of movement of energy that's still going to continue to happen while that person's womb is still what we call in an open state because the placenta is being held inside the womb. Uh, it is born also after the baby is born. And so like the tissue and the vasculature left behind perfectly designed to hold and then release that placenta and also to heal pretty quickly uh, still takes a lot of time. And so we're, we're protective of that space for that reason. We don't want to rush through what we could call this rite of passage. So our rite of passage really marks the movement from one phase of life or one part of our identity into the next. And this happens with every birth that we'll ever have or, or every loss as well. Uh, so it's super significant. And we really want to do whatever we can uh, as facilitators or as uh, space holders or as protectors of the birthing person and their newborn baby because they're going through this very important but really also very intimate ceremony together. Everything that the baby needs to go through, they, they really want to do so in the close comfort and welcoming and warm arms, the environment of their caregivers, their keepers, the ones that they chose to come into this realm, like the ones that are going to hold them while they fulfill their purpose that they agreed to way on that other side. So hopefully this is all like starting to make a lot of sense, like, hmm, like why would, why, why does the cradle board uh, matter and why is it important during this time? Well, there are a few different reasons. One is that because the baby has just gone through like this very, um, uh, very epic and immense ceremony, both physically and spiritually to come here. And so they just need a lot of tender loving care, they just need a lot of regulation, they need to be held, they need to be safe. We want our babies to know that they made the right choice by coming here. We want them to know that it's a safe and good place to be, which is why we treat birthing people with the utmost care and respect, because you want your babies to come into the world and see a lot of chaos and a lot of drama and a lot of disrespect. And a lot of stuff going on and 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 disrespect of the birthing person or do you want them to come and see that uh, their first teaching that they're going to receive is that they look and they see the tenderness and the care and the respect and the love that is put into this person while they're healing and recovering from their birth same thing with the babies we really want them to feel safe we really want them to feel welcome we really want to convince them to stay here uh, in, instead of going back into that other side and the cradle board helps us do that because it's sort of a reminder for them of where they have just come from so it's a way for us to sort of give the message to the baby that they're safe here that this is a good place to be but also that we're not rushing them through that really important rite of passage. We don't just toss them out on their own. We really put a lot of care and intention into holding them. So the cradle board is like, it shows how much intention and care goes into receiving them and taking on that responsibility. Also, it just physically provides a lot of care to that new one because it, again, it represents that um, that feeling of like being held, of being safe, of being very um, tightly uh, swaddled inside the womb. And this type of board here, you can see it's just a board, doesn't have the moss bag sewn into it. Some of you might see or you might have in your community type of moss bag where it's actually like nailed into or sewn into the cradle board itself. And in some communities, what they call a cradle board or a baby board is what I call a moss bag, but it has like a hard back sewn into it. So the fabric goes actually right over top of it. So it can look a little bit differently depending on which community you come from. Uh, for us, we keep our moss bags out of the board and we put the baby in the moss bag and then we tie them into the board. So it's kind of a two-step process. 
So the moss bag itself is, has a lot of beautiful teachings as well. Um, and a lot of this, I also learned from my mentor, uh, you know, from Dr. Church, but also from Beth, who talks about the, the fabric that is wrapped around the baby as being a spiritual blanket for that baby. And the spiritual blanket, like in our language, I mean, I'm going to pull this up in my notes because I'm not fluent in our language and I don't want to screw it up. But our uh, word for the moss bag is wabaji pizon. Pizon, the root word pizon means to wrap. Jipe is the uterus or one word to describe the uterus. And then jibai is spirit. And so wabaji pizon, it, it contains those root words to wrap around or a spirit. It's like a spirit blanket that wraps around the baby. Um, and the way that my teacher describes it as, it's very similar to the, to the amniotic sac that the baby has just come out of. So they have spent the nine, you know, nine or 10 months wrapped around uh, with the placenta, which we, we perceive of as being like, uh, we actually see the placenta as being another baby whose, whose karmic purpose here in this form is to provide life and substance and um, in all of the energy and nutrients that that baby needs for that journey in the pregnancy. And then their life ends when they're born. Uh, and so that's why we bury the placenta is in honor of the life and the sacrifice that the placenta has made to that baby. But in addition to that placenta, the, um, the amniotic sac, which is holding all of that in both beings, both the placenta and the baby, as well as all the fluid and all of that, um, it, it, it is born too. And so again, it's just part of this very gentle transition that we're looking to give the baby. We want them to be reminded of that safety and of all of that goodness that was given to them since the moment of their conception uh, by wrapping them in what we call this spirit blanket. And then physically, it has a lot of benefits also because um, most babies <laughs> like to be swaddled. They like to be held really tightly. They like to be, um, you know, it, it just gives them like a sense of safety. Whereas, you know, if they're kind of out like free, I'm talking new newborn babies, you know, they're, they're very easily startled. And, and that's a good thing. It's part of their reflexes, like life-saving reflexes, part of their innate wisdom and abilities. Uh, but that swaddling just holds them really closely. And it gives them that feeling of remembering. So like remembering that they were held by that spirit blanket on the inside or the amniotic sac on the inside um, and, and putting them again onto, um, you know, being really intentional with the colors and the fabric and the wood and, um, you know, all of that symbolism really matters because it just shows the baby just how cherished they really are. So that's uh, part of the reason why I just really, really love the, this technology. Uh, a lot of people like talk about it as um, being a baby carrier. And so it definitely has this um, like a use or a function, like everything in our life, you know, our ancestors are very practical, very spiritual, but also just get through the day and, and really worked hard to thrive and survive in this uh, four seasons environment that we come from. And so the ability to be held safely in this uh, carrier uh, not only provided this sense of like safety and spiritual teaching, but also like literally just kept them safe so that they could start to observe the world around them. As you know, babies are born with like really nearsighted and high contrast vision. And I have my little uh, breastfeeding model <laughs> here that I was teaching in another class last night. So I'm just gonna hold her for a little bit while I talk about them. But so basically like from the moment of birth, they are looking for, uh, they're looking for facial expressions they can see really dark and really light colors and they're, they can see about this far in front of them. And so that tells us that when they're born, they're coming out with a lot of really smart 
very wise abilities because they're uh, looking to be able to find themselves to the breast so that they can latch on for that nourishment. And then they're also just observing right away. They start to organize and categorize the world around them through listening, through smelling, through watching, and eventually through, you know, being on the ground and putting things in their mouth and that hand eye, hand, uh, hand to mouth and hand eye coordination. So from the moment of birth, they're watching us. And the cradle board gives them a safe place to do that where they can, you know, be sat uh, either on the back or up against a tree or wherever it happens to be, you know, on, on the side of the couch, in, you know, in our modern homes so that they can start to see what life in this community is like. So they are already starting to watch. Um, they know how to act around the fire. So they know that that's where we cook food. We know that people don't go too close to it. We know that kids stay away from it. They're already learning that knives are sharp and that we can cut ourselves with them. We already know that um, the pot on the top of the stove, you don't just reach up and grab it because there's something in there that can really hurt me. So they're already learning a lot and they're also looking at you to see how you interact with the people around you. They're watching you as you eat your traditional foods. They're watching how you interact with the other children, how you interact with your partner, with your elders. They're literally watching everything you do. They're very observant, very keen observers because that's just how they learn. They have to learn how to be an Ishinabe in this realm. So much of that comes from the observation. And so practically it just gives them a nice safe place to do that. Um, but then uh, I heard this too, like when I was in college, it's starting to hear these teachings around how the babies were carried in the board and, and particularly when boards were uh, customarily carried on the back and actually in um, Dr. Church showed us some pictures of how, you know, we kind of think of the cradle boards as having like a backpack style, but he describes it as uh, the really early boards were actually carried on the head. So like the strap would come around like this. So you'd have like complete freedom of your arms and shoulders. And it wasn't until later that we moved to more of this backpack style of a cradle board. Uh, but either way, carrying them on the back also had a lot of significance because they are uh, spiritually, like we've probably all heard the teachings about how our babies are like more spiritually aware or more uh, spiritually open uh, due to the soft spots. So they come out with two soft spots, one in the top of the head and then one uh, more towards the back. And this is to like practically to help them to descend through the pelvis because those plates actually move so that they can make wiggle their way out and wiggle their way down to the birth canal. But spiritually, it's because that gives them a direct place where they can receive like a lot of messages and they can see a lot of the spirits that are around us that a lot of us as adults, as we've closed off our spiritual abilities, we don't necessarily look out and like see like, oh, there's all of these spirits around me and we can't always hear what they're saying as well. But our babies can, because our babies just came freshly from that side. They have that beautiful opening at the top. You know, they're in this really important rite of passage. This is a really important time for them. They're getting a lot of their learning, not only from watching us from a safe place, but also from the spirits seen and unseen that are around them. So putting them on the board and setting them on the back, it doesn't mean that we're ignoring them back there. We're actually giving them the perfect opportunity to see and to hear and to really interact with whatever ancestors, whatever spiritual helpers might be with them. And every baby comes with their own, but they're a lot in our world as well. So uh, again, it just shows you how perfectly designed our ancestors had all of these technologies, not only to keep our baby safe and to give them a safe place to be while we tended to the fire or while we did our cooking or while we cared for our elders, and chopped wood or whatever it is we had to do, but also gives them this perfect space that they can be in order to observe what is going around uh, in the world around them and to hear 
from those spirits. So we say that our ancestors are constantly walking with us. A lot of us have lost our ability to see them throughout our lifetime. Some of us can. We all know that person who like walks in a room and is just like, <laughs> can see all the spirits. And um, we all probably have kids who like, they'll say something and you're like, who the were you talking to? <laughs> it's because they're talking to somebody. They know that they're there, but we just can't see them because we're a little more closed off in that way. So if you ever hear your babies babbling or they look in the other room uh, and they're talking to somebody or like my son, he's always looking up uh, and he'll be looking up and I just know, I'm just like, I know there's a GBI up there that he's talking to and it's cool. And, and my daughter's the same way. She'll be like, oh, there's a little girl standing by the altar. And I'm like, cool, <laughs> I didn't really need to know that, but awesome uh, because they're just really like open to seeing and hearing those uh, little spirits. Uh, this is how they learn a lot of language and they do like tracking of social skills. So all, all of this just to say that these, this technology is, this is so astounding. The more I learn about it, the more like amazed I am. Um, and also the more grateful I am to just be able to, to bring these teachings out back to the community. And so a couple of other things that I'll talk about before we open it up for discussion and question is this virtue that the Nishabe have of self-discipline. Self-discipline is pretty foundational to who we are. Definitely, if you think about, you know, we had to survive and thrive in four seasons uh, environment, uh, going through a lot of, you know, um, we were semi-nomadic, so our ancestors traveled based on the seasons and based on what food needed to be harvested or gathered or what needed to be hunted at the time, uh, depending on the severity of the weather as well. So self-discipline is traditionally instilled from birth onward. And the cradle board also is this opportunity to teach babies self-discipline even from birth. So again, we talked about how they're watching, they're organizing, they're, they're, they know that knives are sharp, they know that the fire is hot, um, they know that, you know, they know that when, when you, when you, um, when you go to the bathroom, this is the room that you go in, like there, there are a lot of things that they're constantly watching us, but it also gives them self-discipline because they're in there and they can't reach out and grab it. Uh, so it is like teaching them that everything isn't for you, everything isn't for you to touch. Um, and all, uh, equally as significant, we, it's a, a, it, at, as important as it is putting them in the cradle board, it's equally as important that we take them out. That's what I was trying to say. And that's part of that teaching about self-discipline too, because it is like one of their first, um, you know, one of the, I guess, second rite of passage that they go through is when we take them out of the cradle board for the last time. And Dr. Church says in their community, they actually take them apart. They don't want, um, you know, they don't hang the cradle boards up like on the wall or anything because then the baby will constantly be going back to it. And it's almost like the baby doesn't want to graduate into toddlerhood or graduate into like the next phase of life. Uh, they, they'll sort of want to stay a baby <laughs> forever uh, because being a baby is hella awesome and uh, there's just more and more responsibility with each phase of life that we get into. So it's important that we let them come out of the cradle board and it's also a teaching for us as caregivers because we are always uh, letting go, right? Like we're always letting go of the past. We're always grieving what has been. Uh, we know as caregivers that the, our life with our children flies by all too quickly and we can't stop it from happening. We can only just be present and do the best we can. So the cradle board, it gives us, um, you know, it, it reminds us that we can't keep our babies babies forever. And I just always joke around and I'm like, we all know someone whose mom never took down their cradle board <laughs> because you know they never matured. Um, kidding about that, but um, that's one of the really important pieces of why we put them in and then also why we take them out. So it's instilling that value of self-discipline. Uh, I've heard Dr. Church say that cradle board babies are really curious. 
uh, because they're they're in the creative board and they're just constantly looking around and so they're naturally very observant of the world around them. Uh, but they are also very respectful. So he talks about how kids who've been raised in cradle board uh, know like when they go up to a table at like a powwow, they don't just put their fingers on everything because they've had that self-discipline of sitting there and watching without being out, being able to reach out and grab. And then finally, uh, not the least interesting bit, a uh, pretty interesting part of the history of the cradle board is that it was really completely perfectly aligned with how our ancestors practiced potty training. So before diaper companies existed, children were potty trained by usually by one and a half years of age, which might sound really early to a lot of us because in our modern culture, due to like a lot of different things in our history with the um, exploitation of diaper companies, our, our age of potty training has just gone up, 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 up to where it's like three, three and a half in um, most of our families today. But before diapers were uh, even existed, even cloth diapers, those cloth diapers you might be surprised to know weren't really heavily popularized until the 1800s here in the United States. Uh, and, um, like paper and plastic diapers or disposable diapers are actually didn't come around until the 1950s. So diapers are pretty new to our community. And so uh, before all of that existed, our ancestors, of course, being the wonderfully uh, skilled and amazing scientists that they were, would hold the babies over uh, really absorbent and antibacterial mosses or furs, depending on where, um, where you came from and what season it was that could be washed and then reused. And so our moss bag, as the name implies, were also stuffed with these mosses so that the babies were always very clean. They never had to sit in their own waste. Uh, it allowed them to be really hygienic and to avoid diaper rash. And so we carry a lot of stories in our community about how like, you know, the, the priests who are coming to like you know, convert our people to Christianity. We're like so amazed that like Indian babies never had diaper rash. And that was because of the use of the moss bag, but also because we potty trained a lot earlier. We did not wait until toddlers were running around to teach them how to go. It was just a normal part of their everyday life. And it was because the medicine that we used in those moss bags uh, or that we used to hold them over while they eliminated was uh, antimicrobial. So it killed germs, prevented infection uh, and, and was also super absorbent. So they never really sat in their own waste. And um, of course, you all probably know breastfed babies have water soluble and very clean poop and uh, also very sterile pee. So things were a lot different back then, but the cradle board also can be used in combination with our traditional potty training methods. That also allowed them to maintain awareness of their own elimination. So rather than being stuffed into a diaper or like they could pee, you know, six times before we change the diaper, they kind of knew like right away that they were peeing. And so that was just another little piece of data for them to observe. Remember babies are constantly always observing from the minute of birth, uh, including through their own elimination. So I think that's the last thing that I'll say about it um, because we're right at the hour and I wanna leave space to see if there's any sharing questions. Um, if any of this is similar or even different to the stories that you carry in your community. And I wanted just to end by giving huge thanks and gratitude to my biggest teachers, which are my children. I have two children, they're really amazing little kids and in their births really sparked a lot of this reclamation. So a lot of how I've been able to reconnect and reclaim and remember and restore all of these fantastic practices was through birthing them and through, um, you know, consciously welcoming them, welcoming them and observing how, how they are in the world. They've really been my biggest teachers. Uh, so thank you so much. I want to um, hand it back over to Rhonda to see uh, how you wanted to facilitate the discussion. But I'm so thankful for you all. And thank you so much for letting me in your homes and for giving me this time uh, to bring this to you tonight. 
Yes, thank you. Um, so my thoughts now is, you know, I know that there are many people here who hold creative board teachings or that just have different pieces. And um, and so I wanted to just make some space for that. And um, I wanted to just start that by, by sharing a couple of photos um, that, you know, I'm hoping <clears throat> are enjoyable um, for people. So give me one quick second. Um, and, you know, my thoughts with this is just because I <clears throat> um, I wanted to just share that, you know, it's just a couple of, of pictures here, um, but I wanted to just share that also cradle boards, um, you know, for like, here's a, a slide that really speaks to it, but I'm from Southwest Washington and, um, and you know, there was also this connection between um, the cradle board and the flattening of the head and the, the custom for that. And so I wanted to just share a little bit about that, um, you know, just as we're as we're learning and sharing with each other um, and how, you know, that the mothers would be, you know, having this cradle board propped up against a tree while, um, you know, berries were being picked or, uh, but that also it served this, this purpose of, of really shaping the head um, and, you know, of, of doing this um, for, for reasons that, you know, are about beauty, that are about identity, that are about connecting people to this is, you know, the, the people that you are from. And, you know, if, if there was ever just a change or displacement and um, that, that this identified you as being, you know, from this region and of these people as well, of just the head shaping and that tradition of the, of, of, just using the cradle board to flatten the head. Um, and then this is also one of my favorite, favorite pictures um, that I love of just seeing this chubby, chubby, chubby baby and, you know, up in the in the berry fields and, um, you know, just this, I mean, this baby is so incredibly just peaceful. And I've heard, I like this photo for a couple of reasons. One, for a lot of the things that you described about how, you know, this is not only just, you know, connection and swaddling and soothing reflexes, but it is comfort. And I've, I've heard a lot of just um, struggle with people who are really trying to embrace attachment parenting and feeling like words are somehow um, a, a distraction from that or a disconnection from that. And I think it comes down to, um, you know, just that that's such an oversimplification, right? That either babies are on our bodies or they're, you know, away from us and detached from us and separate from us. And that, you know, those aren't, those aren't really true. And, um, and that also this reality that we have nowadays of people being expected to be the one and the only for their child inside four walls of nuclear family um, is also just not real and and is in my in my ways just sets people up for such difficult and challenging postpartums um, by trying to have this you know desire to constantly have their baby nurtured and on their body and at the same time not having these supports to be able to do this other really practical important work um to, to for just for survival and being part of community and so when i see this just sweet beautiful happy chubby baby on you know his mama's back um you know i just i just see how um you know they are connected and whether they are in a board or in a swing that this this recognition that our babies are part of community and are attached to us whether the cord has been cut or whether they're tied on our bodies or not um you know is is this oversimplification of how to be an attached parent um and so i hope that i'm i'm making that clear I, of course you know support and love bear be wearing and i support and love you know people wanting to be skin to skin and attach and hearing you know their their mother's heartbeats and um you know being so connected to their people you know their their big circle of people and having that be real and connected 
I just also feel like we need to remember that it's it's not this, you know, solitary, um, you know, piece of 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 trying to command, um, and you know, and that we need to set up our birthing people for for being able to love and parent their babies, and also be able to shower and feed themselves, and you know, this this huge extreme of a pendulum swing, um, you know, I feel like has has really been challenging for for so many birthing families. Um, so I just wanted to say that these are connected to us, um, you know, because, you know, they they see our souls and they see our spirits and um, and that that comfort of the moss bag of the cradle board of a, a swing of and, and I'm speaking of traditional swings, um, you know, are are important pieces that we don't have to choose, you know, to either be one extreme or this other um, that we really can hold both. So I wanted to just offer those photos up and share about, you know, other other aspects of the cradle board. And um, and I'd love to just hear from others who have, um, you know, pictures to share or stories of having and using cradle boards in their own lives and their own parenting journeys. And so at this point, I'm going to uh, change it so that um, people can unmute themselves. And so please do. Um, so, yeah, Shauna, are you interested in? in sharing your baby board to begin with? All right, um, so just to show, um, cause um, Rayanne was talking about when the ones that are like sewn together. So like, that's more like our style, the sack to the board. Can you see it? There you go. So that's the, the bow she was talking about that her baby had torn off and it's just flat in the back. And then we use um, a hardwood also. This one's covered, it's all buckskin. It, it was a winter baby, a January baby. So we use all buckskin. And then these untie. Oh. You untie the top part. And we only um, tie, it's all tangled up. So we only, um, we need it in the middle. So if there's like an emergency, you can like untie to here and take your baby out. You don't have to tie all the way to the bottom. That's one thing that we do too. So like meets here and you can tie this way and that way. That makes sense, but it's all attached how she was saying. So that's like our boards. And typically a Yakima board would have like a handle here, but this is like a Umatilla style because we wanted it beaded, which is all our same area, but so that's our board. One of them. Thank you. Thanks so much, Shauna. And do you know much about uh, Makama and, and if there was any head flattening? Um, I, I don't believe you did. That's not a thing from where we're at, huh? Hi, this is Beth. Um, so head shaping is a part of Anishinaabe. Long ago, there was some head shaping for, um, so as I was taught by, um, uh, a, a man up in the uh, uh, northern Minnesota area during a class I taught up there, he said that um, not everyone had cradle boards. It was actually kind of the elite of the elite had cradle boards. They were also passed down from family within those families. And so it was a great honor to have one, but they were used for the more often uh, for uh, leadership roles. And so those babies did actually have some head tightening going on with a band that went across the top of their foreheads. Um, and that goes along with um, the teachings I've always had about those soft spots. And another reason that they had those soft spots done later was for the shaping of the head. Um, as I've been taught as a midwife that those soft spots are so extremely important and I think that's where it always came from oh don't touch their soft spots it's because those soft spots are so crucial to all of those messages coming from the star realm is what I call it but also because it also does help shape the head formation um, for whatever clan nation leadership role that was supposed to happen within the community 
um, even in this area. Um, the reason I'm showing this cradle board is a little bit different than uh, Dr. Church's. And this one was made specifically, oh, the name is eluding me. I'm sorry, I was in a car accident on the way home. So I'm a little disheveled, but um, he, um, this one is extremely lightweight and it's made out of cedar. And um, he said, you know, that's, that's the way he was always taught by his father and his grandfather. Um, and he um, had never come forward into the community to teach this because he felt like he didn't have enough. Um, he didn't think he was ready yet. And the, and the reason I keep saying he is because in many of our teachings this way, east of the Mississippi, it is the man's role to create or make this cedar board and they go out into the woods and locate and identify a proper cedar board or cedar tree. Not that a woman can't do that, but that many times in our world nowadays, we need to remember that the men had responsibilities to this baby and to the community and we I don't want to say we've taken it away we've not we haven't re in many ways they haven't been reestablished as strongly as um, we have with our indigenous uh, women's ways and so I encourage those women or communities that can do such to make sure that you can get men involved in the making of these cradle boards, at least in this area, that's how it was. Um, there's also another board that's used specifically in this area that's made out of what we call wigwas, which is <laughs> looks much more uncomfortable than these, but I don't have a picture of that readily handy. But um, so I just encourage um, us to make sure that we remember that the men have that responsibility, at least here. I'm not sure, uh, Rhonda, and those of you from west of the Mississippi, if that's the, the same. He also made that uh, dream catcher on there because, you know, we know that we do dangle things. And I did miss the first part, and I, I apologize, <laughs> uh, Rayanne, um, uh, for your beautiful talk that you always do in, in such a good way. This board has the foot part down here. Um, to keep the baby upright. Um, and then he, he created all of the, this has the, um, um, the outer layer. So there will yet, there's a pad, but there will also yet be um, a moss bag. And the moss bag, as I've been told, is where that baby spends a lot of its time um, learning and, and, and hearing and being a part of. And then as Rayanne said, um, when they're put down in this cradle board, that's where they learn um, even more about um, restraint and observation um, and um, the listening to in the community. It also, and I will always say, and I don't know if Rayanne said earlier, I mean, we already knew what safe sleep was with these. So this is just another way that he created his. Um, uh, Tim Whitefeather, that's his name from Leech Lake, Minnesota. Um, so after the class that we had up there, when I went up to teach, uh, at least give some instruction on what I knew um, from Dr. Church's course, um, when we brought him in to he this area, um, uh, Tim finally, because uh, Millicent um, brought him in and apparently I had been asking him to come in and after that class, he was able to finally take men out into the woods to identify those trees. So. I will say always, you know, try to remember to include our men, um, whether it's with that fire to here, we have a fire that's get, that gets lit within the community for those babies um, to, to see their way from that star realm um, for the community to come to say prayers with their tobaccos. And that is a man's responsibility, whether it's the fathers or whether it's an identified male figure within the family or the community to do such things. So that's just some of the things um, that I wanted to share, but we have, we do have some oral history and some documentation um, of, of head shaping here for leadership roles. Um, in some of the communities, not all of the communities. And the taking a part of the board for Dr. Church was also um, actually a Dene way, the Navajo way, they take it apart and store. Um, I, uh, uh, many people west, east, of the Mississippi, east of the Mississippi here, uh, he said, uh, they do keep it together and, and, and hang it. Um, I'm not sure what's right or, I mean, I don't believe there's a right way or a wrong way. I would don't mean to say that. Just that that's just what I had remembered him saying, but I just really enjoyed your what you had to share Rayanne and and um really grateful to um be able to hear what what was shared so miigwech miigwech Beth yeah we I, I've heard too about how 
like our when when you know boarding schools were happening for over 100 years in our community the last one in our state was open until 1983 and so our, i've heard people talk about how like our elders would look at our like perfectly round heads and they would see that all the heads were like the same size and shape and that they would it would actually like they would bring a tear to their eye or that they were like sad and grieving because you know when it showed like the rise in like c-sections and how our heads aren't really molded in that way through birth but also because that showed how our babies weren't held in the cradle boards and so there's like a lot of fear that people would get a flat head or they would shape the head in some certain way but then i've heard other people say just like you said um that it was supposed to be like that and when they would look at the round heads everyone looking the same with the same head shape then it was actually like very sad for them and there was a question here i'm not sure if you can see it beth um or rayon just of the you know when when the men were tasked to seek out that cedar tree or that birch tree? Um, did they fall the whole tree or, you know, how was the rest of the cedar tended to? What I was, um, what I, because I, it's a man's world <laughs> in that, that realm, um, I, I didn't go out with them, but what he said was that the tree was, what I remember him saying was that the tree was chosen um, specifically to garnish at least I want to say he said four to eight boards. I know that's a huge difference in, in numbers, but enough to sustain the community, to share those boards. Um, and they would identify the tree specifically so that they could go up so far. And then the rest of the tree would have been utilized via ceremony um, and or wood for that baby's uh, fire um, that was coming into um, to being, um, however that was. So um, every part, obviously, as we know as Anishinaabe people, that every part of that tree was used, whether it was through the medicines of the, of the cedar boughs or the tree itself that was left over, but they would harvest as many as they could. He also said he would look for healthy trees nowadays, unfortunately, in some ways, unfortunately, he would look for a tree that had freshly fallen so that he didn't have to chop a, because we know our trees are all not doing well in many areas, that he would try to locate a freshly fallen tree that may be half, halfway gone up top and fallen down. And then he would use that lower part that was still healthy. So those are the things that he spoke about. I didn't specifically go out with him because he was taking a group of men later. Rayanne, can you see the questions? Uh, question, is it okay for the baby to sleep in the board? I've heard it's different in different tribal traditions. I say yes, but then again, <laughs> like I said, you could go eight miles down the road and if you ask someone the same question, they'd be like, hell no, that's not right. Um, so I think it's probably different in the way that, you know, depending on which community you're learning from, but my belief in, this could have been like a whole other, you know, one hour long conversation about safe sleep. But it, my belief is that, yeah, they do sleep in there. Um, you know, I've seen historical photos of babies sleeping in there it leads them to like, um, Dr. Church says they sleep better in the cradle board or, or even if it's a moss bag alone without the cradle board, you know, just the swaddling like really keeps them very safe and protected. Uh, and something we didn't talk too much about was like this um what i call it hulking out <laughs> like when they're in the you know when they're when they're in the swaddle uh, whether they're tied into the moss bag or and or in the cradle board they're doing like what dr church calls these isometric movements so they're just kind of constantly pushing up against the board and they're just like wiggling a lot in there and so it was it it's as if you were like doing a push-up and somebody just came and like put their hands on your back so you just had a little bit of extra resistance when you were doing that so they're they're not in there just like passive little like sacks of potatoes um, they're really actually getting a lot of head and neck control they're developing like the ability to look around um, this is all balanced with a lot of uh, with, with a healthy amount of being out and crawling and being free range, you know, they're not in the board 24 seven. So my understanding is due to all of that and, and 
um, due to the fact that they do like to sleep in there and it leads them to sleep longer, um, just better for everybody. So that's, that's what I would say, but maybe Beth has something else to say or others in the group as well. Um, same as you, Rayanne. I mean, I've been, I believe that our children are very safe on that board. So what my teachings were from the community is, um, for, um, sleep, um, others may not. That's why you see dream catchers on there so that babies can sleep. And that's where they get a lot of the teachings from their ancestors during that time. Um, so, um, there was something I was going to say about that. <laughs> but it just eluded me. So, um, yeah, I guess I'll leave it at that. I just, I agree with you on that. Um, not coming back to me. Um, I know that, that Dr. Church also believed in that he was taught by his Dene father-in-law. And he said that that was specifically used during nap times only, not at night. However, I believe, and I continually believe as I've been taught that, and I'm not disagreeing with Dr. Church because I love Dr. Church. I, my teachings were that having that baby in that, in that cradle board is um, a way specifically even now so more, but even back in the day for safe sleep from, for many reasons, not just from someone rolling on the baby, but also um, from animals, um, whatever that may be predators, um, they would be a little more protected in that um, and could be swiftly moved um, if it had that carrier on it to be moved quickly. So it, it's a practical sense, like Ray Ann said, we were practical and we continue to be practical people. So um, yeah, so again, I, I, I agree with all that was said. I have a question. Um and I'm sorry if I, I've, I've been trying to multitask because I'm still technically at work, um, but I'm, I'm so thankful to be in this conversation. Um, I wanted to know, um, you know, something that kind of concerns me and concerns a lot of people is like SIDS. Um, and I was wondering if there's um, kind of any stories um, or, or teachings about cradle boards that might relate to, to helping to prevent that? Yeah, I, I could answer this too, but I wanna hand it back to Beth since she's my mentor and um, has spent her whole career in this field. So I'd like to um, ask her to answer that first. So I will just say straight up, um, that is a, that is a, in today's world specifically, it is more of, I would say, it is a part of prevention of SIDS. It assists, but we also know that not smoking, not overheating, um, uh, the alcohol, drugs, all of those things. There's so many dimensions that go to it, but safe sleep um, in that, in that, within that cradle board is a yes with the ca caveat that there's so much more that goes to safe sleep, such as sucking um, uh, nutrition of, of the mama um, and um, especially um, keeping the baby not too warm, but also no smoking um, and uh, drugs and alcohol. Um, one of the things that always concerned me, and I will just say it this way, is that one of the things that they, they had a, a, a back in the day, because I'm so old, but back not that long ago, but seems like it was that long ago. Now they had a, a course that was developed by, I think in March of Dimes, it was a safe sleep program for um, Indian people and no disrespect to anybody, but it was taught by someone who was non-Indigenous um, in this area anyways. And one of the recommendations was to have a, the baby in, put the baby in um, a, a lot of the families were given, uh, laundry baskets and I panicked at the thought of a baby laying in a, a laundry basket in the situation where you coming home, um, you're exhausted, you're tired, especially anybody else living in the home and there's a laundry basket, hence they would throw their clothing or whatever blankets on top of the baby, not knowing there's even a baby in there sleeping. And that concerned me. If you think about a cradle board that I call it a roll bar, <laughs> um, 
is one of those things that protects an arm from flopping over on or the mother or father from rolling on to the baby, it would be much more protective mechanism than a laundry basket or a drawer, which many of us know of our grandparents who slept in drawers um, back in the day. So I believe that this, the return, I don't know if that's the best word, but um, seeing these cradle boards back in the community is a, uh, is a great celebration in the sense that I believe that is a part of safe sleep. I think the magic in that resurgence is also that it's not happening in like its own vortex that there's so many people doing so much really good work to bring more awareness of everything else that we talked about so like when I talked about cradle boards I didn't just literally talk about the cradle board like you heard me say a lot of other things about the birthing ceremony about postpartum care about the newborn reflexes. So a lot of this reclaiming the knowledge of not only the technology goes hand in hand with reclaiming the knowledge about how our babies develop and how um, how we can live in right relationship to not only them to, but to ourselves as well. And so I think that like the research, there's very extensive research and a lot of professional people who can really speak to like infant mortality prevention. I think that the cradle board goes hand in hand with that. You know, that's originally why I started to dig into this inquiry because, you know, it is safe sleep. It is back to sleep. And we invented that crap before, <laughs> before they took it away and then like try to come back and tell us, uh, oh, this is safe sleep. And it's like, we already had this within us all along, but it, it, a lot of that knowledge had been lost through time due to the boarding schools and all of that other stuff. Um, and there is another question about, if there were any negative experiences with healthcare providers regarding the use of the cradle boards? Um, again, <laughs> I know Beth could speak to this too, but um, we, we have had heard that in, in, in our communities, quite a few stories about that with people that don't really understand the cradle board. They're very concerned about like, literally like tying the baby really makes them nervous because we've seen a, a lot of our practices are seen as being like neglectful, you know, it stems from like this very deeply held like um, discrimination against native people. Like our practices are backwards or they're, um, you know, they literally tried to scrub this shit out of us through the boarding schools. So of course the people descendants that haven't fixed that part of themselves, then that's the story they carry within their own DNA. So there's a lot of like confusion or miscommunication about that. And we have had families that they're kind of like, looked at funny for these um, things. But a lot of the work that's been done in our communities too is to raise more awareness out in the community about how our stuff's actually like superior, how our practices are infant mortality prevention. Not only that, but it's infant thriving. It's not just surviving, but it's thriving. Um, and um, I just tell like my doula clients is don't even bother bringing them in <laughs> unless you want to ask a bunch, answer a bunch of intrusive questions. Uh, but unfortunately, like even our foster families, if they're, they're not allowed to foster infants that they have cradle board in the house at all. Uh, so there's still discrimination that happens. There's still policies that don't match up with the best of what we know to be true about our culture. So there's still a lot of change that needs to happen. Today. I think what I just want to add to that is, I guess I'll go really quickly, um, is that I feel like some of the acceptance around cradle boards is is really a push towards um, having our babies in like in that that is it's accepted to have babies in cribs and like separate from from us and so i've heard a lot of support about that just being another safe option and it being accepted on that end and then also you know more recently there was this you know concern about just extensive swaddling and how that you know inhibits um, you know, the, the motion of the hips and the development of the hips and contri a contributor to hip dysplasia. And so then there was that worry in that extreme. Um, but what I think I want to just really is that our day is not supposed to be the same. Our day is not, you know, a, a, 
uh, our day is not supposed to be where our babies are away from us or our babies are fully on us or like babies love interacting with the world and learning about the world and you know they they they, they love being a part of of their people and um and you know also just having these different experiences and so no one is advocating having a baby in a cradle board all day long or all night long and um and that that is you know a, a confusion that just like a crib would be very unhealthy all day long um so would a cradle board and that's not what is being encouraged but yeah how people have spoken to just feeling safe and swaddled and grounded and a net passage from the stars, um, you know, for you coming into your body is, is, is something that I think so many people just need and crave. And this is one way of beginning our baby's life, beginning that journey of, of our, our, our children, um, you know, with that intention of that, you know, we, we honor their connection to the stars and we, we are demanding that they be parented with our, our traditions placed at the forefront. And then that matters, you know, in a huge way. Um, and I know Shelly, you, you know, posted just the link um, in the chat box, but I'd love if you wanted to share more just because, you know, it, it is such amazing work for 18 years in prevention of infant mortality and, you know, helping to bring those, um, you know, bringing those just experiences back um, for Native families. And so I'd love if you shared more um, and, you know, if you if you feel open and also whoever it was that was on the call at the same time as me, um, you know, please do take this time to share as well. It, it, it was me. And I just wanted to say as a, an Indigenous midwife and a nurse midwife, I have had those experiences in the hospital situation where I have possibly had to transfer somebody um, who was using their cradle board into the hospital situation. And they were um, given much grief um, uh, uh, to the degree of being turned into CPS for, as Rayanne said, like tying down the baby because the one cradle board that was being made in the area, and, st and, and, and I missed that because I was the first one that was being made in this area by one of my elders. And, but, but he used the parachute cord specifically, and it, and it does look like you're tying your baby down. Um, there's no understanding of the importance of what that actual design of that, you know, tying down of that baby and the design that we use and the, and the pattern that we use to do that has significance to it as well. Um, so I know I hear a lot lately about um, translation exhaustion um, or I'm hearing this new term, I guess I should say, I am a firm believer that until we thoroughly exhaust or thoroughly explain to the outside world the safety and efficacy of this board, which we, as Rayanne and, and I know, you know, has said eloquently that this is safe sleep. We knew this already and we did. And so therefore back to sleep is already there. So until we educate, and so there was extensive education. You know, I spent 18 months just educating about placentas coming home and, and, and arguing with a nun at a Catholic hospital until I got them to understand that there was a religious freedom act and our lawyers would be talking to each other until you use those terms, there's this constant back and forth. And there, and so we, we may have to have some of that translation exhaustion that happened continuously if that's the term that want is going to be used but until we have some of our ways explained to the degree only for our babies to experience this full bringing in from the star world into their moss bags on you know onto their mothers first into the moss bags and cradle boards as needed in the hospital situation if that's so desired by the families um i think that we need to be very i don't know it's just me personally. I only speak for myself. I believe it's extremely important for us to continually, um, maybe not explain is the best word, but to educate um, the, the importance of this to whom we are. And I think it can happen, but it, it is exhausting. But I think our families and our next seven generations are worth that exhaustion on my end to continually explain why we do these things. And so for me to be a good ancestor, I'm going to continually explain and educate the hospital staff 
the nuns that say no for 18 months and numerous phone calls and getting ethics, you know, people involved until I have to say there's lawyers now going to talk to you and I no longer will talk. So I believe that we need to stand firm and be warriors with this in some ways. I don't want to bring forth the woo stuff, but sometimes you have to because some of, uh, many of our babies are born in hospital. So yes, it, it, it does happen, but that's just my experience. Not a lot but enough that it was concerning and I had to go in and reiterate teachings within five years of each other. So um, I'll chime in just real quickly. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm so in awe of what I sort of think of as our frontline workers in the birthing world. Um, so you doulas and midwives and doctors and nurses, you know, the people who are out there really serving our families. And so I just wanna say thank you and acknowledge up front that um, I'm an organizer. <laughs> and so I, I've been working with this community group for that's been around for about 20 years um, that first came together out of concerns about infant mortality rates that were so disproportionately high in the Native, you know, American Indian, Alaska Native community um, in King County, specifically Washington. Um, so what we what we began doing right away was just like convening people and bringing people together each month to go learn from the data and to learn from the moms and from the frontline workers who were um, in the community um, helping helping our families have their have their babies and um, in the course of all of that it, it was clear you know speaking to Beth's point, it's like we needed more advocates and allies to understand our perspective, um, how, um, you know, how, how, how our perspective as a cultural community, as a, um, you know, even in the urban, as urban Indians, there are cultural things we have in common um, that we can advocate. Um, it was about educating ourselves and it was about educating um, other practitioner, you know, providers, healthcare providers and such. Um, so we felt like all of that was fine, except that we really wanted to offer something back to the families and the moms that were having babies that were maybe separated for many complicated historic and family tra trauma reasons from their culture and from um, home. And so we, um, you know, there were there were women in our group who had raised babies in cradle boards, you know, whose that tradition hadn't um, been broken in their communities. And um, they kind of came together. So Arlene Red Elk was one. Um, she's a, a Jamestown Sklalem woman who worked at United Indians of All Tribes Foundation. Um, and Joyce Williams, who um, was a, a community member who was also really good with a sewing machine and you know other, other folks like we tried to figure out like what would be the right thing knowing we have more than a hundred different tribes in this community, tribal uh, cultures represented, you know, like what would be the right way to go about this. So we came up with a, um, a model, if you will, that is um, based on um, a plains, um, version, which is pretty close to what you see with the Yakima Nation, and I love the one that Shauna showed us um, in the Colville tribes. And um, so, I, you know, I could go on for like an hour, probably, and presenting the the twenty year history of our group. But but basically, we ended up doing um, classes in groups of about ten. In fact, that's where I met Rhonda. She came with with one of her um, babies and moms. Um, that she was working with as a midwife. And um, we bring a partially assembled cradle board, which we've crafted um, to that point with a lot of mindfulness and, and smudging and praying for the health of the baby that's gonna be born. Um, and that will be finding this cradle board as their home. Um, we, you know, we spent a day, we spent a day with these mostly, you know, new moms, sometimes they bring an auntie or a, um, a sister or a partner, sometimes we have male partners in the room, or female partners in the room, who, who also do the work. Um, and we, we do the handcrafting part and show them how to assemble and, and include their prayers in the final, like, assembly of this cradle board. Um, and then they leave at the end of the day with a little bit of a um, 
a little bit more deeper understanding of the importance of culture in their role as a parent. We do talking circles through the day. If, we, if it comes up, we talk about safe sleep. If it comes up, we talk about safe housing and find the social worker in our partner organization that we were partnering with to come and support this mom. Um, I mean, I think I've painted the, the basic picture of what we do, but you know, I just encourage you to go um, to that Facebook page if you're on Facebook and see some of the beautiful work that um, these moms and, and babies have done. Um, we did one class I wanna mention real quick that um, we actually had 15 people and they were, the, they were providers, you know, what we call providers. So people from the Seattle Indian Health Board, um, doulas from partner organizations, um, people, a King County public nurse, public health nurse who's Alaska native. And, um, and in that class, we're able to not just talk about the work we do in our community collaborative, but, but to really um, grow our circle and um, build the network, you know, because I think that's what it takes. It takes all of us supporting each other to support our moms, to support the babies. Um, and yeah, I think I'll just stop there. Thank you for um, the chance to share that. Um, I wanted to just speak to the question in the chat box of, um, and feel free to add anyone else as well, but um, you know, there, especially for those people from communities where, you know, the ground is hard and frozen, you know, there's very much times where we could not, you know, bury our placentas and, you know, that that might have looked a lot of different ways that might have looked like a clay pot that might have, have looked like, you know, a specific storage place that might have looked like a, a, a basket. Um, you know, there's, there's different ways that that might have happened. And I feel like if it comes to whether or not you feel comfortable placing your placenta in the freezer and having that be respectful, I feel like, you know, that your your intention behind that and that, you know, whether we use these, you know, gems of modern tradition or not, um, you know, that, that the intention is for you um, to carry the placenta to the place where you want to plant the roots of your baby. And so if there is this time where, you know, prayers and a pause and a freezer are a part of, of that experience, um, I would just sit with that and, and, you know, find it. It matters to a lot of people of what lands their placenta is buried in. And, you know, and so I would just res respect the, the traditions of your people. But what I see as a midwife is that it feels more important to plant the roots of their baby in the, in the lands and the territory that are their home, um, even if they're away for a time. And that, you know, preparing, using the, a, a freezer or um, a, a clay pot or anything like that. Um, I don't consider it disrespectful at all. I consider it um, a reality of us often being far away um, from our, our territories and, um, and that, you know, you can do that in a good way. Does anyone else have anything to, you know, those of you with hard, you know, ground and feet of snow every year, um, you know, that just speaking to that. Yeah, drying the placenta, there's, you know, that we all, and whether it's men or women, we, we could have entire Zoomcast episodes on just placenta ceremonies, and we all tend to our placentas in slightly different ways. You know, how how our cords are tended to, where they're buried, you know, in, in doorways, in medicine pouches, in, you know, on, uh, with certain trees, all of these pieces, um, you know, are, are very connected to who we are as unique people. Um, and so I, I think just sit with, sit with your prayers and, and your elders and, um, and, you know, find a way that um, you can honor um, the life and the gift that that placenta has offered, um, and that there isn't going to be a wrong way when you when you approach it from that uh, intention. I don't know if Rayanne shared this, and I don't mean to speak for you, Rayanne, but one of the most beautiful things I saw was the the because 
the UP of Michigan. I'm in the southern part of Michigan. The UP gets horrendous amounts of snow compared to us. Did you share, Rayanne, about how Josh did your lesson? Do you mind if I share that? Sure, go ahead. So I was safe I, and I, warm I, inside <laughs> when you guys were out doing all that. So, <laughs> so I I have I have also had um, women who have opted to uh, freeze. I froze had them in my freezer even um, placed in, in such a way that was um, except, you know how they wanted it to be done. Whether it was red cloth, you know, it, within a container. Um, and, and they would say, well, our, and I agree, oh, our ancestors would have used freezers if they had them just like they would have used, you know, telescoping, um, uh, I can't think of the name, um, for teepees, the, the poles, um, the fiberglass poles versus wooden, if they would have had them, because we were very, you know, we were always very curious and very advanced in, in our way of being, but, um, so they didn't have an issue with that. But one of the most beautiful experiences I had was with, uh, during Rayanne's birth with the Bosana and Josh, her husband had gone out way ahead of time, just prior to snow falling, I think, and dug a hole where they wanted it. And he saved the dirt, um, had the hole um, already there. And the dirt was, I, I do believe, correct me if I'm wrong, was in the basement in a, a big pot. Um, and so when it was time, all he had to do was bring the pot up of the dirt to um, when we um, planted or buried, however you want, what terminology you want to use, um, the placenta back into the earth, um, that, that dirt was fresh, which I thought was, was pretty awesome. Um, that was really um, using his ingenuity and his creativity and um, foresight and, and also again, his involvement in his child's birth that was a process that was thought through and he carried that through as a man so i i, I you know kudos to that because it was beautiful for me to see that so i just want to throw that out there because i was very that was a first for me and I, and it was it worked so beautifully so i just wanted to put that out there and i i don't mean to speak for you rayanne or josh but that was beautiful for me to be witness to and be a part of So our, our time is coming towards the end, and um, I wanted to just see if anyone else has any um, thoughts or stories or questions before we close. Rhonda, can I say one really quick? Um, the story about sleeping in the in a cradle board. In one of our classes, um, we had a grandma who talked about how her grandchild that stayed in the cradle board for the longest. Um, was like three and still wanted to spend time in her cradle board. And that's how they knew when she was ready for a nap is that she would just go to wherever her cradle board was and she would start unlacing it and get ready. And she'd just kind of wave to somebody to come and, you know, lace her up in her cradle board. And I thought that was so sweet. <laughs> just wanted to share that. It just, you brought that memory back. Just a humorous note. Um, when my first granddaughter was born, we put her placenta in the freezer, planning to bury it under a tree uh, in their land. And uh, with their moving and their moving and their moving, <laughs> they have not had a place, nor have they been able to go back to uh, the ter tribal territories. And so I still have that placenta in my freezer. And my 18 year old granddaughter, <laughs> plans to bury her own placenta herself. <laughs> I think that's sweet. And, and yes, it's, um, you know, I think that I had a conversation recently with some people who were, were really sad of just not, you know, they, they were aching to have a, a coming of age ceremony for themselves. And one of my tribal elders just said, it's never too late, um, you know, to be gifted these pieces, you know, that, that we're needing um, that help to make us whole. And so, um, you know, if we, if we happen to be in our fifties, when, you know, where we experience that, or if it happens to be when this, you know, person is and now an adult and you know, burying their placenta, it's, it's, it is a, a lifeline. It's important. Um, and so, you know, I think that we're, 
we're very much uh, a, a resilient people and a creative people and and that you know it doesn't serve us to just think that there's only one right way um and but that it's still just important to offer all the pieces that we can um so yes i i'm just curious if um we have, and I want to thank you, Shelley, for doing our opening prayer. And uh, I'm, if anyone feels open to doing our closing prayer, I'd love to just open that up, especially to an elder who's on the call today. Shelley, do you feel open to offering us a closing as well? No, so I'll confess. I was just typing into the text box. I'm so sorry. I need to go, but I'll, okay. yes, I'm going to take another deep breath. And I'm going to express appreciation for all of the wisdom that was shared here today. Um, there's a lot of heart reaching across this Turtle Island. Um, I don't know where everybody was from, but so beautiful. And in the chat, I'm seeing um, people that I know and work with like Memory, Gladstone. Um, so happy to have this moment with, um, with beautiful people. Um, so I'll offer this um, creator, thank you for every moment that we've spent together. Thank you for all of the sharing and wishing each and every one of us and our families creator that you would bring us health and balance and some good laughter as some medicine to carry us through these times. Aho chi